Welcome everyone to the Alum Fellows Reading Series. Today we are honored to have as our guests former fellow Robin d'Avignon and discussant Damilola Adebayo. Robin d'Avignon is an, is an historian and anthropologist of West Africa with a geographic focus on Senegal, Guinea, and Mali. As an assistant professor of history at New York University, she teaches courses on African history for all time periods, in addition to courses on the history of science, technology, and the environment. Her research engages with the history of science and the environment, ethnic and state formation, and the politics of historical production. Based on over 15 years of cumulative oral historical ethnographic and archival research, Robin's first book, A Ritual Geology, Gold and Subterranean Knowledge in Savannah, West Africa, has been recently published by Duke University Press. And it is also freely available as an open access edition. And it is this work that we will be learning about today. Damilola Adebayo is an assistant professor at York University in Toronto. He is an historian of Anglophone West Africa, particularly Nigeria. Currently, he is researching the socioeconomic life of Western energy and communication technologies in Africa since the 1850s. He is keen to understand the varied contexts within which these technologies were introduced and adopted by everyday people and how they have been a cause and effect of change in African societies. Forthcoming is his book length, book length study, Power to the People, Electricity and Urban Life in 20th Century Nigeria. So the format of this session will be as follows. Rob, um, Professor Davignon will read selections from her book. Then Professor Adebayo will engage her in, dis in conversation. And finally, we will open up the session for a Q&A with the audience. So welcome everyone. And Robin, thank you for participating. And would you like to start? Great, thank you so much for that warm welcome, Krishna. Um, I just wanna begin by saying thank you to um, the Hutchins Center and to um, the wonderful staff there. Um, uh, it was during my fellowship year in 2018, 2019 at the Hutchins Center that a lot of the core concepts for this book really took shape. Um, and it was a really transformative space um, for me intellectually. So it's it's truly an honor to be back here to share a portion of the work um, that in part um, was a product of that of the fellowship um, of that this really unique space. Um, so what I'm going to do today is actually share just a couple excerpts from the introduction of the book um, by way of introducing a couple of the bigger argumentative threads that um, that I follow throughout the, the course of the book itself. And as Krishna said, this book is open, is, is, is available fully open access. Um, so you're, you're welcome to Google it and find it online too, if you'd like to. I'm gonna share um, a very small slideshow to go along with it, to give us a sense of some of the texture of the places and people that I'll be talking um, about today. So bear with me quickly. I'm just going to share a portion of my screen with you. Sorry. <laughs> Let's see, is this gonna cooperate with me? Oops, sorry, one moment. There we go, portion. I'm having a bit of a technical difficulty. It won't let me um, manipulate this. Um, all right, so you know what? I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna have to forego the slideshow, unfortunately, because it's not gonna let me share it um, without showing my entire screen. So um, a ritual geology is, situates what economists have coined the 21st century scramble for Africa's resources within two intertwined histories. The first thread documents how the French colonial state and its post-colonial successors regulated or payage while also profiting from the gold discoveries of West African miners. Um, or payage is the term that I use in this book to talk about the work of gold digging, exploration, and prospecting by West African men and women. Um, it is a term um, that it's a, a French term that was introduced uh, during French colonialism and early exploration that translates roughly as gold panner. Um, something we can talk about in a bit is, um, you know, the kind of politics behind the use of this term today, but just by way of situating us. Um, Sorry, 
Um, African mining economies, I argue, were central to the emergence of modern exploration geology in West Africa. This claim inserts struggles over mineral discovery into the history of mining capitalism in Africa, a field that has studied African miners as laborers and victims of land alienation, but rarely as intellectual actors. The second thread of this book concerns how West African societies have cultivated knowledge about the underground, made claims to mineralize land, and managed gold mining and trade. By the time of French colonial conquest in the late 19th century, Orpires elaborated a, quote, ritual geology across the Beremian rocks of Savannah, West Africa. I define a ritual geology as a set of practices, prohibitions, and cosmological engagements with the earth that are widely shared and cultivated across a regional geological formation. West Africa's geology is neither monolithic nor static. Rather, it has evolved and adapted to different corridors in response to shifts in regional markets, migration, and the arrival of tools from elsewhere on the globe. In its various iterations, this ritual geology has shaped how Africans governed, mineralized land and people, including miners, traders, state makers, and earth scientists. Scholars have glimpsed the edges of this ritual geology, but studies bound by region, colony, ethnic group, or nation state have failed to capture the spatial and temporal breadth of this regional phenomenon. By placing data from my research in dialogue with historical, archeological, and ethnographic studies from across the Sahel and Savanna of West Africa, this book models a new regional approach to African history, one that is centered on geology. I also explore how different groups in West Africa mobilized the past to make claims to gold-bearing land to the state, to one another, and to corporate capital. To demonstrate precisely how the past resonates in the present, I move across several temporal and geographic scales. My account begins and ends on the gold fields of Kedagu, which is located in southeastern Senegal in the 2010s when I carried out ethnography, oral history, and archival research. I weave these sources together to explore the history and active life of Orpaillage in southeastern Senegal, a region that is central to the history of gold in West Africa more broadly. The book's middle chapters widen onto the gold fields of modern Guinea, Mali, and Senegal from the medieval period to the Atlantic age through the French occupation of the West African savanna in the late 19th century. I then track attempts by the French colonial state and independent West African states to profit from Orpaillage as a source of revenue and subterranean knowledge while excluding agrarian residents from durable rights to minerals. This project is framed by the ongoing corporate enclosure of West Africa's gold fields, which threatens the future of one of the world's oldest indigenous gold mining economies. Thus, this book is also an account of the meaning of history and an urgent present. Um, the passage I just read you is from pages three and four of the book. Um, I'm going to briefly elaborate um, uh, by going a, a bit further into the introduction on page 13 and 14 to read a bit more um, from a section called Searching for Subterranean Knowledge. A ritual geology focuses, trains its focus on the decades, centuries in some cases, of mineral exploration that precede the opening of a mine, whether corporate or artisanal in scope. This approach departs from most scholarship on mining in the global south, which examines the extractive process itself or the social life of decline, quote, after the rush. It is during exploration, I argue, that the expectations and grievances for future extractive projects take shape in the political imagination and in modes of storytelling. <clears throat> Resource exploration is uneven and time consuming, contingent on capricious market conditions and luck. Geologists can spend decades studying a zone before a mine is established, and most exploration projects never identify a mine worthy prospect. This uncertainty, paired with the latent potential of discovery, shapes the sociology of spaces where mineral research is concentrated. This book is one of the first sustained accounts of the central role of African mining expertise in geological exploration and colonial and post-colonial Africa. In recent years, the history of science has expanded beyond its conventional geographic focus of Europe and North America, to document the contribution of non-Western experts to scientific discoveries formerly credited to the West. 
We have learned that many technical innovations passed off as European were, in fact, the hybrid product of cosmopolitan contact zones populated by Asian, indigenous North American, Caribbean, and African healers, traders, farmers, and blacksmiths. For colonial Africa, it is now well established that European agronomists, ethnographers, botanists, and cartographers garnered methodological and conceptual insights from African healers, assistants, hunters, and translators in the field. In a parallel vein, scholars of the Atlantic world have documented that Africans contributed not only brute labor to plantations in the Americas, but also expertise in pharmacopies, rice farming, and animal pasturage, among other domains. While historians have shown that Africans were always part of global scientific production, they have attended far less to how laws determine the benefactors of epistemic exchange under conditions of sustained inequality. One exception to this in African history are studies of the exchange and appropriation of botanical knowledge or bios prospecting. Um, and some of this work as a caveat um, has been done um, with great uh, deft by the scholar Abenadav Oseo Asare. The parallels with mineral discovery in Africa are remarkable. Most European mining enterprises in colonial Africa began as takeovers of African mines, followed by an investment in capital. This was the case for gold mining industries in 19th century South Africa and Ghana, and tin mining in the early 20th century on the Joe's Plateau of Nigeria. Um, of course, Despite largely, but despite the ubiquity of these practices, political struggles over mineral discovery are largely absent from histories of mining in Africa, which are focused on capitalist expansion and the exploitation of land and labor and the emergence of collective and ethnic politics in mining towns. Of course, many Africans were exploited um, in these enterprises, but others generated scientific knowledge on which industrial mines depended, a fact that has been elided by a scholarship that has not looked at these contributions in detail. Um, in tracking how Orpaiage in West Africa shaped exploration geology, this book examines how West African societies gave political form to geological processes on their own terms at the same times as they transformed what has become known ge as geology um, beyond the bounds of the African cont continent itself. Um, and with that, um, I'll open this up uh, for discussion, which I heartily look forward to um, with all of you, starting with Damalola. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. Damalola, you, yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to discuss your work, uh, Robin. Uh, I think your work, uh, which is a historical and ethnographic study of uh, gold mining in West Africa is one of the best books that I've actually read in recent times. And I mean that sincerely. I was excited to learn a great deal about an indigenous mining system uh, in West Africa and how that system has been shaped and reshaped over time uh, by French colonialism and global capitalism, uh, especially extractive capitalism uh, since the early 2000s. There is so much to say about the book uh, from the sources to the arguments, the high for detail, to the lucid writing, I mean, it's lucid written. Uh, since I do not have uh, much time, I would like to make a few observations, um, particularly on the second thread of mm. the book, which is on African knowledge production. So as a historian of uh, technology in Africa, I am excited to see another book length uh, project that takes African uh, knowledge production seriously. Uh, one major critique uh, of the history of science and uh, technology uh, in Africa, of history of science and technology in Africa, uh, is the fact that research often uh, prioritizes Western ideas, uh, Western norms, Western notions over African modes of knowledge production. Uh, this is why uh, the analysis of ritual geology, which is in the title, uh, is critical. Uh, again, uh, it's interesting to read about how uh, the knowledge of the grant itself uh, mm -hmm. is fused with uh, 
African spirituality. Uh, and I'm using the word spirituality because the word religion is nebulous in this in this context. Mm -hmm. And also with uh, African scientific and technological knowledge systems. Uh, a couple of things I wanted to say, but uh, I would make at least uh, two or three uh, methodological observations, uh, some of which I think I have discussed uh, with you uh, before now. Uh, so I'll start from the acknowledgement, and it's quite funny that I'm starting from the acknowledgement, uh, because for me, the acknowledgement of a book is more like reading the intellectual history of that book itself, uh, understanding how the book came to be written, and understanding some of the challenges that the author had to overcome, etc. And I thought it's one of the longest and uh, most heartfelt acknowledgement that I've ever read. Uh, one thing that struck me was the ability to recall all the many names of the people who helped to birth the book over the uh, almost 15 years uh, gestation period. Uh, if anyone hasn't read the book, I would encourage them to look into the introduction. I think it's a, it's a work of good scholarship on its own. Uh, the fact that uh, she gave accolades to all the co-creators of the narrative, not just in the acknowledgement, by the way, but throughout the entire book. Uh, this is critical because um, we're in an age where, uh, in which researchers are uh, often, often criticized for writing as if they are the uh, source of every knowledge and every analysis and every argument that they are producing in the book. But here, the author is gracious enough to recognize the co-creators of the knowledge, uh, uh, especially because we're talking about a practice that dates back to over a thousand years here. And uh, there is so much uh, lesson that I have learned personally from that. But beyond that, as I read my Robin's book, I couldn't help uh, but bring it into cons uh, conversations with other, other scholars. Uh, so for instance, um, the idea of ritual geology itself. Uh, from my knowledge of Anglophone West African history, uh, I know that uh, historians, apart some, some African historians, some Nigerian historians especially, uh, working with the idea of the ritual archive uh, in recent time, and I was hoping on a selfish note uh, that I would see uh, a methodological analysis of that approach in itself. Uh, the idea of uh, using the ritual as a method uh, for, for studying anything. In this case, for studying uh, mining history in uh, Savannah, West Africa. I was hoping to read more about uh, some of the pitfalls of, of this, of this uh, of this method in itself, uh, it's it's welcome. It's it's a good uh, rebuff to uh, research that rely exclusively on Western archives. But at the same time, it would also be important, I feel, for me to learn more and maybe for some of the readers who might be interested uh, in that to learn more about uh, the strengths and uh, some of the limitations of. Uh, ritual geology or the ritual archive itself. If, if you agree with that term, uh, I would love to hear uh, your thoughts on that. And then uh, beyond that, but I also thought that um, your work also speaks to uh, all the research that uh, engaging with uh, African knowledge production. I'm thinking of a particular author here, but I wouldn't want to uh, uh, mention a name uh, because the major, critique of research that work with African knowledge production is the question of where are we in time? Uh, sometimes you read a work and you find it difficult to, to place precisely what the narrative is about. Uh, the question of time, the question of uh, uh, the, the recognition that some of these narratives are not just monolithic. Uh, which is where I think your work also stands out in this context. Uh, not only are we learning about a practice that has been existing for a thousand years, gold mining, within the context of gold mining in, in, in Senegal and uh, Mali and other areas, we've also, we were also able to learn, uh, thanks to, uh, to the lucid writing, we're also able to learn how, how, about how the practices 
changed over time, not just in the recent uh, past, but as far back as like a hundred years ago, we, we were able to like start seeing the, the changes, how the leadership of uh, the Opayach changed, how the influence of the chief of each village changed over time uh, with regards to mining. And I think this is something that uh, historians and other ethnographers should pay attention to uh, in future work. Uh, the question of time, where exactly are we in time? And uh, the question of continuity and change. This is something that has been uh, very well addressed. Uh, I've only raised one issue at first the book. Then the second issue that I want to raise uh, is the also on the choice of uh, Opayaj or Opayo, or the, the, the people who mine the gold, the artisanal miners, uh, if we can use that word. Um, I noted in, in your book that you said the word has a racist uh, or colonial as well as gendered origin, uh, and that the meaning of the word has shifted over time, and that African men and women have adopted the word to describe themselves and their mining activity. And uh, you chose to retain the concept intentionally. And I was reflecting on that. I thought uh, that demonstrates uh, a measure of sensitivity that is often uh, also missing in many works that claim to, to do decolonial scholarship. Uh, sometimes uh, scholars tend to push uh, the narrative to the other extreme in an attempt to recover the voices of Africans themselves. Uh, so because the word has as a racist origin, let's throw away the baby with the bathwater. But I thought uh, it's also important to engage with research subjects, with, with knowledge co-creators, as they would like to be addressed. Uh, so for instance, and I think I've discussed this with you before, for instance, the whole idea of the word tribe in, in, in African studies, many historians of Africa and even many historians of uh, non-Western societies would avoid the word tribe. But today, when people travel across the continent of Africa, if you use words like ethnic groups, it doesn't make sense to the average African on the street, whether in Central Africa, whether in West Africa, uh, both Anglophone and Francophone, people would regard themselves as uh, tribesmen and women. And they wouldn't necessarily define the word tribe in the same uh, colonial context or in the same racist context. Their definition is now much more expansive and much far more complex than uh, what are the original proponents of the term meant. And I think it's important to, to always uh, bear this in mind as, as we do our research as well. Uh, so now I'm already thinking about how words like tribe, same way you use the word like uh, operage uh, in its context, even though it had racist uh, origins, but now means something uh, quite positive, if I can use that word. Uh, I think the same way uh, scholars, generally anthropologists, historians alike, can uh, should also sort of, I think it's a call to rethink starting terminologies uh, in, in African studies especially, but even beyond African studies to studies of other global South, non-Western societies, uh, because the fact that we condemn a certain word in the, in the classroom, such word and phrases may not necessarily have uh, strict credibility, if I can use that phrase, uh, like on the straight people, most people who we're dealing with may not necessarily know uh, the importance of what we're talking about. So that said, uh, I have two questions. Uh, to recap, before I move to the two questions, I have only raised two main issues, by the way. Uh, the first is the question of uh, ritual, geology, and, and how far we can expand that term, and also bringing the term ritual geology into conversation with other uh, works, recent works, on the question of the ritual archive in African studies. So that's the first point that I've made. And then the second observation is on the use of the word opayage, uh, and how uh, that's an interesting perspective with regards to how African studies is currently being done, uh, with regards to how we tend to jettison phrases and words with racist origin, and how we can actually revisit those terms, engage with them uh, on their own terms, really. Uh, but then, so moving on to the two questions, I was 
uh, as I was reading, I came across the fact that you said uh, many gold miners, many artisanal gold miners, the Upayos, they resisted Islam uh, and were called pagans for the most part. And it got me thinking about the story that almost everyone knows, the story of Mansa Musa, the, 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 the tenth man south of the Mali Empire, uh, the great Mansa Musa, who is famous or notorious uh, because of his extravagant lifestyle, uh, how he squandered the wealth of, of the Mali Empire, the gold wealth of the Mali Empire. But he was a Muslim, right? And if Muslims were not involved in gold mining, how then did, uh, was was able was Mansa Musa able to personalize the the wealth of the Mali Empire? I mean, that was one question that that I thought. Uh, and then, if uh, gold prefers pagan, I'm quoting you verbatim. Uh, how was Mansa Musa, who was a Muslim, who uh, led an Islam, uh, a kingdom, went on Hajj multiple times? How was he able to regulate the gold trade? Uh, trade? Uh, to the point that it could that the commonwealth of the people basically belonged to it. Then um, the second question is um, much more conceptual, and it's on the question of expertise. So who is an expert? That's the broad sense in which I phrased it. Uh, what exactly is scientific expert expertise? And the question is rooted in the in the sections, multiple sections of your work, uh, in which you discuss the relationship between the opiates and the geologists, the scientific, uh, the, the Western geologists, or those trained in geology in the Western sense. So I'm thinking about the limits of uh, ritual geology here. If, for instance, uh, the opiates with their knowledge of these spiritual nature, the geobodies, the spirit of geobodies, that's of course the title of one of your articles. Uh, if with all their knowledge of the ground, with the sacrifices and everything, they are still unable to discover certain deposits, especially for Lord Ord, uh, the uh, low hot or something like that, if, if, if you, I'm sure you get what I mean. If they're able to discover that until uh, the geologists trained in the scientific in the Western scientific uh, tradition came, even though the Western scientists also relied on local knowledge, but then uh, what's the limit of the, the ritual geology in this context? I would stop here uh, so you can uh, respond to uh, my question. And if I still have the time uh, afterwards, I might ask one more question. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much um, uh, for all of this, um, for this rich commentary. So I don't know, I'll, I'll try to move quickly through a couple points and meditate a bit longer on others. Um, so actually, you know, two of your comments about, you know, the, the concept of a ritual geology um, and deciding to use a term such as orpaillage relate, in my mind, to um, problems about conducting research on a topic, in this case, you know, indigenous gold mining in West Africa, which covers such a huge geography. Um, and, and also in, in the book, I mean, it's people have been actively mining gold in this part of the world for over a millennium. And I do choose in this book, um, it begins and ends in the present day, in the context of increased competition between artisanal gold miners or ore payers and um, corporate mining enterprises, um, which are operating um, uh, in the region today. Um, I do delve into this much, much deeper past in which these gold fields were incorporated, right? So chapter two of the book um, is 800 to 1900 AD. And then I talk about the gold fields that were part of what became the French empire of French West Africa. So Senegal, Mali, Guinea, to some extent, what is today Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, um, so there was not uh, one term used uh, for gold miner across these different spaces, um, uh, much less across the different time periods that were at play. Um, uh, Maninka, um, which is a variety of Manding languages, is in a lingua franca of sorts across this space. Um, you know, historians, 
have have traced in part the rise of um, Maninka as a lingua franca in this larger space to the fluorescence of of empires, the Malian Empire um, uh, being the primary one in this in this region. And these were empires whose wealth was was built on gold um, and and other trade goods, but gold being the most important. Um, however, like the more research we do, the more ethnic and linguistic heterogeneity we were finding in terms of the different individuals and communities who engaged in gold mining. And in the setting in which I did a lot of my intensive ethnographic and oral historical research, um, that included Pular speakers, Soninke speakers, who referred to their work in gold by a different set of um, vocabulary um, than was used by Maninka gold miners. So um, in this in this context, um, or pailleur, which was a term introduced by the French, um, it was actually introduced during the kind of Atlantic age of exploration um, in the 1700s to the region um, has been taken up right by people in the present day, particularly folks that are organizing themselves um, into economic units um, that are engaging in protests against mining companies that are federating themselves in order to take out permits um, for mining, um, refer to themselves as 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 orpires. So. Um, while it was tempting to say, oh, I, you know, I kind of want to jettison this term because I become intensely aware of its colonial and in many respects like racist origins because the French referred to the work of African miners as um, kind of gold panning, um, as, as primitive, as less sophisticated than the work of miners or mineurs. Um, even when African miners were digging gold at deeper, at, at greater depths than French mining um, enterprises, et cetera. But, but this is a term that has become important to people, right, um, as a way to claim what their occupation is um, in this part of the world. So I, um, you know, give the history of that term and its complications, but ultimately decide to adopt it. Um, and, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, this is, this is a, huge issue um, in Africa, not just African studies, but in any part of the world when you're writing in English, like in our, you know, in this particular context or French, um, but you're writing primarily about uh, languages, right, and ethnic and linguistic affiliations um, that are expressed through completely different idioms, um, you know, but I am writing about a geography in which there was no one sort of African term, quote unquote, to take as its replacement, there's a whole diversity of terms, which that in and of itself speaks to the complexity, right, of this technological enterprise and the social and political worlds built around it. So, um, I, you know, I, there, there's not a simple solution to these problems. And in fact, I think in each case, they need to be worked through and articulated and thought about, right, in our writing and in our conversations about what is the you know, the best terminology and every choice is a political choice um, and has a different set of stakes involved with it. And in my case, I decided to follow the lead of the individuals that I, you know, upon whom in the present day, this work was inspired and largely based on. Um, so a ritual geology, by contrast, was a conceptual term um, that I coined to talk about a set of engagements that are sacred in nature that are shared across a very, very large territory um, that appear to have been elaborated with West African men and women who have engaged with gold mining trade and gold prospecting, as well as other kinds of engagements with gold um, that again were, are sacred in nature, um, but that do not constitute a religion. So no one is like saying, you know, like gold mining is their you know, religion or the set of religious practices or, you know, ritual practices that we see elaborated around gold mining that are quite common. In fact, what appears to unify them is that they're a set of practices very explicitly related to mining gold and mining gold um, in geological formations um, that are quite specific, that are found across uh, the West Africa and Savannah and Sahel and in the forested regions that later generations of geologists have called Beremian rocks. So um, I, it was a term that I found useful for thinking historically about the ways in which these practices and engagements with the earth in part technological practices, but also conceptual engagements 
um, and theorizations, right, about the underground that we find in oral traditions and in oral histories and in some pieces of the archaeological record as well and shrines and things like that where we're able to reconstruct some ritual activity um, to try to think about how these ideas might have spread and might have been coherent even as they were engaged in and adapted by different communities of gold miners in different spaces across time. So again, there was not a single word, right, to describe the totality of this. And it is in part an artifice to think of it even as a totality, but it was my attempt to try to grasp right, this historical phenomenon in its, you know, in its vast geography across time in a way that didn't just make it seem like these practices were isolated to one community that had been studied by a colonial ethnographer in the 1930s or by an anthropologist today in the 2010s, which most work on this phenomenon have has been these kinds of snapshots, right? So it was my attempt to say, look, this is deeply historical, it is unfolding across an enormous space and it has a set of shared practices, both physical practices, but also concepts that fall short of being a religion as such, but are part of a kind of ritual dialogue with the earth that is sophisticated and coherent and ought to be part of the historical record and ought to be something that we can talk about in a comparative way with religious phenomenon that has been elaborated in relationship to particular formations in the earth and other parts of the world, right? So by labeling that, that was an attempt to make it something that could be spoken about comparatively in this space regionally, but also across other cases in time and space, right? Um, and in terms of um, uh, just, just very quickly before we open it up to conversation, you know, with others, um, one of the features of this ritual geology that I elaborate in the book, and I talk about a, about five, five or six different kind of core features that it has, even as it evolves across time, but that sort of make it a coherent tradition. And by tradition, I don't mean something static here. I mean something like a tradition, like a religious tradition, right? In the sense that we might think of Christianity, Judaism, Islam as a tradition. I'm thinking of this as a West African mining tradition, just in the same ways that we might think of modern mining capitalism that we practice in, in, in the West as a particular mining tradition, right? That has a set of practices, but also a set of philosophies undergirding it, concepts um, about how to do things. Um, that, you know, these are both scientific traditions of a sort, technological traditions, but that, are, you know, map onto very different worlds and ideas about how things ought to be exploited. Um, but one of these core features is that, um, at least from the earliest traces of evidence we have that are as early as 900 AD in the context of West Africa, mining is associated with quote unquote pagans, right? And this is, this is a term that is, you know, um, Th that is being used in a derogatory fashion by um, uh, uh, it, largely from third party observers in the broader Muslim world who are writing in Arabic um, that are that are trying to understand right um, something about the gold fields from which all of this gold is originating that's working its way across the Sahara and into gold markets um, in Europe and in the Arabian Peninsula as early as 900 AD. Um, but the association with gold and pagans is something that in a quite fascinating fashion pertains, you know, across the historical record as late as the 21st century in some corridors of West Africa, although that something I talk about in the book is changing quite rapidly with the increasing um, conversion of, of, of many lineages that historically practiced gold mining to Islam. Um, but Mansa Musa, who himself, for example, he was he was a uh, he he was a, a, a king and emperor of the Empire of Mali, who made this famous voyage um, to Mecca, carrying uh, caravans of gold with him en route that he distributed along the way, most famously in Cairo. Um, uh, Mansa Musa himself was Muslim as were some of his predecessors and all of his descendants, as far as we know, and many nobles, many kings in West Africa during this time were, were Muslims. Um, but quite interestingly, they did not control gold mining or production, they controlled its trade. So there was a really sharp dichotomy between those who mined for gold, 
um, who practiced a diversity of different religious traditions, only some of which we really have reconstructed or understand in any you know, depth. Um, but this kind of dichotomy between gold as something of the pagans and gold as something that became part of the wealth of these West African Muslim empires is something that pertains as a tension throughout the historical record. Um, so, um, you know, this um, is kind of one of the puzzles in part of like West African history as it relates to global trade. Um, but this uh, sort of um, what in part, as I argue in the book, I think geology played an important role in this. Gold was found in these geological shear zones that were not good for farming, that were not places where large empires or state making projects emerged. This was hard scrabble land. It was it was difficult to cultivate it. Um, but um, this, these are kind of these um, you know, shatter zones, as James Scott, um, building on the work of others, has, has famously written about. Um, these were places where people sought refuge from state-making projects, and those state-making projects were, in many respects, often they were, they were Muslim. Um, so these became spaces in which a variety of religious traditions flourished. Um, and were practiced that had very little to do with gold mining itself, but gold mining became an avenue for an additional income source for folks as they continued to sort of met out a living um, and some intellectual and religious independence, right, from larger Muslim states in the zone. So there's a number of other things that you raise that I think I'll try to return to in the conversation, but I'm cognizant of wanting to open this up to everybody else who's, who's on the call. So thank you so much. Thank you both. Um, Professor Shubramanian. Oh, can you hear me? We can hear you now. Thank you. Okay, good. It's weird. It gave, it, there was a message saying participants can't unmute themselves. So I wasn't sure how to unmute. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry about the confusion. No, no, it's fine. Um, thank you so much. This sounds it's utterly fascinating. Um, and I'm just, um, I'm amazed by the scope of the study. Um, and so I had, I had one question about the scope <laughs> and, and another question about um, this really interesting comment you made about uncertainty. Um, so the scope, um, I mean, part of what you seem to be arguing for is, uh, I mean, you said it yourself, a, a regional approach right, uh, to African history, um, and that part of the, um, part of the argument is, is to allow the scope of a material resource like gold, or the scope of a kind of geological formation, um, to inform the spatial and temporal contours um, of a study, and not political or cultural boundaries or other kinds of boundaries. Um, but I'm just wondering about the challenges um, uh, that a study of this scope um, poses for getting at some of the things that seem so important to you, such as cultural conceptions mm -hmm. um, and such as practices of claims making, both of which are usually highly context specific um, and context that context in a more delimited sense, right? Now, not in the sense of the kind of spoke, the scope of a geological formation. So I wonder if you can say more about the challenges that you faced um, in trying to kind of square, uh, you know, the scope of a practice with, um, with perhaps a, a more spatially circumscribed set of cultural conceptions and practices of claims making. So how did you deal with that, uh, the connection between these things? And the, se the second question was about uncertainty. I mean, you said, I think what you said was um, because of the incredible time frame of exploration that typically precedes mm -hmm. actual mining, um, that there's a high degree of uncertainty and that this uncertainty shapes a sociology of space. And um, that kind of jumped out at me, and I wanted to hear more about what you meant uh, by that. Um, and then just a, a final thing, I mean, you know, you seem, it's clear that you're really um, invested in a kind of detailed account of these contact zones of knowledge production, right? And in part, this is to sort of challenge the reification of 
something like geology as Western science, right? Mm -hmm. So you see that it's made up of many threads, but, but I, and I guess this kind of is partly about terminology, right? Um, so when one says that, you know, that there's African knowledge and practice that sort of informs um, geology, um, how does one both hold on to that and attend to the historicity <laughs> of, of these sort of African conceptions and practices, right? I mean, this, these are sort of moving targets um, and one needs to sort of make them properly historical. Um, so the term African, how does that fit with this kind of longer historicity? Yeah. No, I really appreciate all of these questions. Um, they're sort of at the core of a lot of a lot of what I grappled with in the in the writing of the book, which um, sort of by way of, of of tackling the first question, which is about scope, you know, scale versus um, you know really attending to claims making and the hyper specificity of it. Um, this didn't begin as a project with these ambitions of scale in terms of geography or even really temporality. While I was of course deeply aware of how old gold mining was in, in the region, I, I was initially interested in sort of the past 150 years, right? In terms of the onset of colonialism and decolonization and how that, um, and, and questions of, of knowledge and law like in relationship to gold mining. Um, in fact, I really wasn't interested in religion and was really <laughs> even worried, you know, about, uh, you know, I was kind of actively avoiding like a lot of those questions until they just became so of such paramount importance, right, to the people that um, I was interviewing that it became impossible to not have that be a central thread in the book. And I think that's like all scholarship. It takes you places you don't expect, particularly, I mean, the archive does that to you, but certainly people do it to you even more um, because, you know, they they bring you unexpected places and in, in conversation. Um, so for me, um, this, the, the way that I dealt with that, my approach um, was that this was ultimately and first and foremost, a book about Southeastern Senegal, which was a place I had lived and worked prior to embarking on this project. It was that experience that led me to this project. Um, and it was in conducting research in this space that the scale of the project began to grow, right? Um, in terms of both time depth, but also geographically far beyond the bounds of like the French empire, um, as I really began to follow um, stories, right? Um, both in the archive, but also, you know, oral narratives um, about gold, which in this region are often associated with snakes that um, traverse through the underground and emerge in a number of different regional settlement narratives um, associated with water, but also with um, gold and with iron. Um, so there, there are some, because of the importance of the iconography of these snakes and the importance of them in so many regional narratives, um, there, there's a way to kind of track, you know, um, some phenomenon related to gold in ways that I think would be really difficult, if not impossible in other settings. Um, but so for me, it was always rooted in a set, in a very specific agrarian um, landscape where I built relationships, where I felt that that initially came to understand in a highly contextualized way, the sort of claims making that was going on around gold and mineralized land vis-a-vis -vis what was becoming an increasingly intensified corporate gold mining frontier. And it was from that setting that I then and do expand my scope. So it's one that's very rooted, which I think is very different than a lot of history of science approaches, for example, that are, you know, are very intentionally like looking comparatively or you know, looking at equally at three case studies from three different geographies, for example, and putting those into communication. That's not the kind of book that this was. And in part, that's why it's also a work of ethnography and history, which was quite specific to the topic, but also to my entry to it. Um, so, so that's how I dealt with that tension and this sort of, um, you know, just briefly about the kind of sociology of, of, of mineral exploration, which other natural resources fall into this. I mean, there's, you know, a growing work, um, mostly by ethnographers that are looking at resource frontiers, including resource frontiers that never come to be, right? And the kind of sociology, if you will, I'm just using that term loosely, that comes to accrue around um, exploration. And, 
this is something I became keenly aware of because I'm in, in Southeastern Senegal and in many parts of, of Savannah, West Africa, you have a context in which corporate and before them colonial and state geologists have been looking for gold, mapping, conducting all sorts of field research, you know, over decades, now centuries. And it's only in the past 15 years that you have the emergence of like, quote unquote, you know, industrial scale mines in this region. And that is a very different phenomenon than if you shift to the south of the continent and look in South Africa, where you have an industrial mining frontier now for you know over 150 years. It's very different in places where there was no historic indigenous extraction of a mineral, where you have the opening of a mine. There's a very different set of expectations, right, and claims making than around a mineral where the local population has been mining intermittently for a millennium, and are intensifying their own explore, you know, exploitation of it in a particular economy in the present day when other kinds of um, ways of making a living um, are you know, increasingly circumscribed. So I'm trying to get at what does that look like in this space, but, I'm, but, I'm, but I am also interested in that being a question that more historians and anthropologists take up because I think it is so critical, right? I mean, with the kind of intensification of, well, mineral exploration just being one domain, um, but I think there can kind of be a tendency because political scientists have for so long sort of dominated some of the resource literature, at least on the global South, to see it as a kind of formula to help us understand when protests happen, you know, or like, well, of course, like this is how people are going to react when a corporate mine is opened, when in fact that's like far from that's far from the case, that's far from clear. Um, and the degree to which sort of more informal claims making are heard by a government is also highly uneven. Um, so in West Africa, it's just off the table to just expel, you know, or pyre artisanal miners, what, whatever terminology you want to use from corporate mining firms. Like that's a politically un unfeasible. So it's really then much more this kind of patchwork dance of concessions and, you know, um, uh, yeah, like concessions, I mean, informal concessions, I mean, to try to make things work. And I think trying to understand that um, is crucial. And this book is just one little piece of that puzzle. Um, but I see it as like a, you know, a broader kind of like important area of inquiry with um, a number of different questions, I guess, embedded in it, um, some of which are about the history of geology and some of which have very little to do with it. Um, and just very quickly, this question of African and geology and how do you deal with that tension? I mean, I think this is something that um, the best work in like the global turn in the history of science is grappling with. Um, and my, you know, I have kind of some future work where I'm delving a bit more into this specifically with the history of kind of global geology. But I kept that a bit bracketed in this book. I tried to be very clear that it's not just that like some threads of this African, you know, like ways of, of, of thinking and doing things get folded into geology, which is really my focus that, you know, that wasn't the project I was doing here. I think that project should be done, <laughs> but showing the ways um, in which, in fact, despite the enormous amount of exchange of labor and knowledge across these different domains over the span of decades, centuries, like geologists as they were, you know, like, um, from the colonial state in particular and post-colonial states, that these remain very distinct ways of doing things, right? And that this is kind of a West African way of mining that has certain concepts, including moral imperatives about how this mineral ought to be used or not used, um, that are distinctive and worthy of understanding on their own terms. And that are, as a way of doing things is under direct threat, right? By the rapid depletion of these gold fields by um, industrial mining enterprises. So um, that was my approach. I don't, and I, I think it's just one among many. It, it felt in a way that the deeper I got into the book, the more I was like, we need a lot more studies about the history of geology in this part of the world. And I'm really just doing like one, and, and what do we even mean by a history of geology? Um, and I, I really feel like I'm just beginning to peel back the onion um, with, with elements of this project. So thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, Professor Adebayo, would you have some concluding comments or questions? 
No, actually, uh, but thank you for the opportunity to um, say something again uh, as we uh, move to the end of the talk. I also want to, if I could just add to uh, one of the questions that was asked by uh, Professor Sumbra of Manian uh, mm -hmm. on the, especially on the use of the word African. I thought from my reading uh, of uh, the book that uh, it was also like in, in bits and pieces scattered across different pages, of course. Uh, it was it was an issue that uh, the author was uh, sensitive to uh, on the on the also on the changing identities, right? Uh, who exactly were these people? Why should we call them African and why don't we call them by their um, native or uh, or uh, ethnic identities uh why should we just but i think uh to be on the safe side uh because it's it's a big question that i myself am also thinking about but i think uh <laughs> yeah through it i think to be on the safe side if uh i think the word african even though it's nebulous even though it has its own problems but it's still sort of like the safest uh even though it means so many things and it opens up its own kinds of one, but I think it's more like the safest word to use at this point, since uh, if we were to go uh, beyond uh, the Anglophone terms, even the, the the terms in the local languages themselves would then open up even much more complex issues on the question of identity. And uh, we have four minutes. I I think I should keep the question I want to ask. I wanted to ask a question, but I, about it, it's a tiny question, but I think I should just keep it. Uh, I could ask privately later. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I guess I'll just close though by going back to some of these questions of terminology, right? Because this, I think this comes up too, and it's also a question of um, um, when you're when you're doing something that isn't about one quote unquote like ethno linguistic group that these questions arise, and I and I, I guess I just want to underscore how you know, utterly contextual these things are. I mean, I insist I have an entire chapter in the book, um, the last one, chapter seven, dedicated to forcing the reader to go through, you know, um, the, the, the deep sort of recent ethnic and linguistic history and religious history of Southeastern Senegal and the sort of shifting terms in which people have understood themselves and how it relates in gold mining, because it's critical to understand claims making, including more intimate struggles um, unfolding within households um, around this resource, right? And unfolding between households and the state and corporations. But then there's other settings in which referring to this as a West African tradition, vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, um, what is claimed as a Western scientific tradition is really critical. And I think um, is, is playing an important role politically. Um, to show origins, right, of different kinds of practices that often aren't um, properly attributed. But anyways, this is also a question of scale and like when is it appropriate to use these different terms and move across these different scales, which I grappled with and struggled with, like in the writing of the book and landed on like one version, you know, that I hope is, is legible. But I think, and this is, you know, to return also to Professor Adebayo's research, the kind of critical need for more histories of science and technology from the African continent, right? And from different regions that are thinking through these issues in dialogue with the global history of science and technology. So, you know, it's like a field that's really just still finding its footing, but, you know, one that I hope more people will take up as a project. Thank you. Um, Professor de Avignon, thank you so much for your amazing scholarship on this indigenous mining history and extractive capitalism. And we haven't had a chance to touch on it, but touch upon it, but it's also particularly provocative given the current urgencies around um, the environment and the sustainability of the earth. So thank you so much for this discussion, both of you. And thank you for the audience for watching and participating. Thank you all. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks.